glad you're here today. I was reminded when Brad was up talking about we're not going to do the meet and greet thing. I don't know where Jim Russell is. I'm kind of going to throw Jim under the bus a little bit. So Jim was uh, talking with our food pantry workers yesterday, and he said, now, okay, we're going to be careful. So we're not going to do the, the, the handshake and the hugs and everything. We want to be careful. He said, but if you want to greet somebody, you can give them an elbow. So give them an elbow. He said, or you can do the foot greeting. You know, have you seen the guys do the foot greeting? He said, or if it's somebody that you really know, you can give them the hip bump right there. <laughs> so um, if it's somebody that you know, you can give them the hip bump, even here at church today. So we're glad we're here. And as Brad said, man, we are fully trusting in God. Obviously, we need to pray, but God's in charge of this situation, and we are completely trusting in him. If you brought a Bible today, I'd encourage you to open it to the book of Judges, the book of Judges in the Old Testament. So let me ask you this morning, who is your favorite superhero? Think about that for a second. You maybe thought you'd never hear that question in church, but who is your favorite superhero? I asked our staff that this week, and uh, Chase said, and I'm going to give you their answers just as they gave them to me. Chase responded that he likes The Flash. The Flash is his favorite superhero. He said, I like him because he has the best moral standing, and he always tries to do what is right and never kills his enemies. I thought, wow, that's a pretty good answer. Evan was just a little bit deeper. Evan said that his, fa his favorite one is Spider-Man. He said because he's the neighborhood Spider-Man. I thought that tied right in with who we are as a church. Evan actually wrote, he said, he cares about his community, and he's superhuman, but he has human problems. I thought that was a pretty good answer. Brad said, Brad said his favorite superhero is Mighty Mouse. He said it was Mighty Mouse because Mighty Mouse goes wherever there is trouble. He fights on sea and land. And Brad said, let's be honest, who doesn't love a mouse who flies and wears a cape, right? So you can't, you can't help but like that. I was so impressed with, with their answers because they weren't just simple answers. They actually thought through them and they asked me, who was mine? And my favorite superhero is Batman. And they wanted to know why. And I said, because I thought he dressed cool. That was the only reason why I liked Batman. And you might be thinking of the modern Batman. So we can put a picture of the modern Batman. Do we have that to put that up there? So, but that's not the one I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about the Batman I grew up with. How many remember this next Batman? That's the Batman I'm talking about right there. All right? Some of you millennials might sit back and think, I never saw that Batman before. You are missing something. Go back and watch the 70s version of Batman. And remember how, remember how when they, you know, punched, it was always zam and pow and all of that. And then he would end by saying, you know, come back next time, the same bat time and all of that. I'm going to mess the whole thing up. Anyways, I love Batman. Anyways, whether you realize it or not, the Bible is filled with cool superheroes. You might not recognize it, but it is. The Bible is not a boring, stuffy book. If you're here today and that's the opinion of you that, that you have of Scripture, that's not the way the Bible is. It's not a boring, stuffy book. To the contrary, it is a book that is filled with action. It's a book that's filled with adventure, and yes, it's a book that's filled even with stories of men and women who did heroic stuff for God. So today we begin just a, a brief four-week series that we're simply titling Unlikely Heroes. We're going to walk through, we can't study every story in the book of Judges, but we're going to look at the book of Judges, a book that may or may not be familiar to you. As a matter of fact, let me just kind of do a little survey today. How many of you, and no embarrassment either way, but how many of you have read the book of Judges before? Would you lift your hand? All right, that's a segment of our congregation. How many of you have ever heard a series of messages out of the book of Judges? All right, that's less people right there. All right, but how many of you know who 
Samson is. All right, there's a little bit more people. Or Gideon. Anybody know who Gideon is? All right. Or Ehud. Who? That's the unlikely hero that we are going to look at today. So today we start in the book of Judges. The book of Judges is the seventh book in the Bible. It follows the Pentateuch, obviously Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then comes Joshua, which I would label as the most exciting book in the Old Testament as it describes Israel going into the promised land and uh, declaring holy war on the Canaanites and conquering the land that God had given to them. And Joshua, what I believe to be the most exciting book in the Old Testament, is followed by the book of Judges, which many consider to be the most depressing or the most heartbreaking book, not just in the Old Testament, but in the Bible. And you might sit back, if you haven't read it before, you might sit back and say, okay, Brian, you're certainly not encouraging me to read the book. Who wants to read a depressing book? But the book of Judges is depressing, not necessarily because of the material. I promise you the material will captivate your attention, and you will see it in the story that we're going to look at today. But the book of Judges will irritate you. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. The book of Judges will irritate you the same way that news reports about tra child trafficking should irritate you. You see, as we read through this book, you will see that Israel's spiritual condition doesn't get better during this book. It gets progressively worse. And the Israelites go from following God... In the book of Judges, this, this generation who, uh, who followed God and did what God wanted them to do, they saw the, the miracles, they escaped from Egypt, crossed the river, uh, the, um, the Red Sea, experienced all of that, and just really experienced God's blessings to a generation of people that it says in the beginning of this book that they didn't even know what God, who he was, or the works that he did. And so the Israelites go from following God to idolatry, to sexual perversion that's found in this book, to the oppression of women that's found in this book, and even to sacrificing children. And you might read this and you might get a sense of holy anger as you read this book. It should arouse some holy impatience with sin, not only for what the Israelites did, but I would hope that it would arouse a holy impatience with sin in your life and mine and cause us to take a deep look at ourselves. So, so this book, and you have it in your outline there, this book contains a cyclical pattern that is repeated over and over again in the book of Judges. It's kind of like the joke, you've heard the joke, Pete and repeat, we're in a boat, Pete fell off. Who was left? Does it, nobody ever heard that joke? Vicki, you're the only one who heard that joke? So let me tell it again. Respond. Pete and repeat, we're in a boat. Pete fell off. Who was left? Pete and repeat, we're in a boat. Pete fell off. Who was left? Repeat. And so the idea is the joke keeps going on and on and on. That's kind of what we see taking place in the book of Judges. There's this, there's this cycle, this pattern, this cycle of sin and God's judgment that is seen over and over again throughout this book. And quite frankly, as you read through it, it's no joking matter. It contains a cyclical pattern that's repeated six times. And here's the pattern. I'll give it to you. It's in your notes. It's apostasy. Israel turns from God. As a result, they are punished. And they experience the judgment of God. They then cry out in repentance for God to liberate them, and for God to forgive them. And God responds. He sends a judge who delivers them, who liberates them. And then they experience a season of peace until, guess what? The cycle repeats itself over and over and over again. The key verse is found two times in the book of Judges. The easiest place to find it is the very last verse of the book. In Judges 21 and verse 25, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Doesn't that sound a little bit like today? <laughs> Do
doing what is right in our own eyes, making our own determination as to what is right and what is wrong, and ignoring what God says in his word. That's what takes place over and over in the book of Judges. So today, we're not going to begin in the beginning because we don't have time to go through the whole book. So we're going to jump to Judges chapter 3. And I would encourage you, when you get home this afternoon, dolphins aren't playing, not sure whether the heat are playing, read the first two chapters of the book of Judges and kind of catch up with where we are. We're actually going to jump in the middle of Judges chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. Now, i got to confess from the very beginning, this is my favorite story in the book of Judges. You, you, you might laugh, you might be a little turned off by it, you might sit back and think, I can't believe that is in the Bible, but it is the Bible, and we're going to read it and tell the story, and hopefully in, a, in an interesting way that you'll understand not only what is taking place, but then we'll try to draw some conclusions for our lives today. And so notice, Judges chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. We'll put the verses up on the screen. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Remember I told you about that cycle, that repetition of sin and judgment? And so once again, this isn't the first time, but once again, after having already experienced punishment and judgment and deliverance, they find themselves sinning against the Lord. Verse 12, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel. Why? Because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So Eglon gathered himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites, gathered Israel's enemies together, and they went and defeated Israel. And they took possession of the city of Palms. The city of Palms is just another description for the city of Jericho. And so Eglon grabs this army and and they form this army made up of different countries. And they attack the Israelites and they conquer specifically the city of Jericho. Verse 14. And the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, for 18 years. So here's, here's God's people in the promised land where he had promised that they would be. And yet, because of their rebellion, their apostasy, God sends judgment and they're oppressed for 18 years. Notice verse 15, the cycle. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. And here's what God did. He raised up for them a deliverer. Here's the guy I mentioned earlier. Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjaminite, a left handed man. Let me ask, how many left-handers we have in the house? All right. This guy had a superhero name. It might be the Southpaw, you know, or if he was Latin, it might be a Sordo or something like that, huh? Here was this left-handed Benjaminite that God raised up. The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. Oh, Ahad, Ehud, excuse me, had an ulterior motive. Notice verse 16. And Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, and he bound it to his right thigh under his clothes. So let's kind of get the story so you follow along. He's left-handed, right? So he takes, he makes the sword, a dagger, 12 to 18 inches long, and he puts it on his right thigh underneath his clothes. Verse 17, and he comes and presents the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab, Now, Eglon was a very fat man. Not my words, Bible's words, all right? This guy was big, all right? Eglon was a very fat man. And when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent the people away who carried the tribute. But he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded silence. No doubt the king in his ego sat back and thought, oh my word, this guy has a secret message for you. And as you read, Ehud even kicks it up a notch. So Eglon sends all of his servants out, and it's just Ehud and Eglon there. And Ehud gets just a little bit closer to him, and he says, I have a secret message to you from God. And Eglon, man, he is all into this. And so remember, he's a rather large man, right? The text says he's a fat man, all right? So the text says that he's so interested in this message 
that he lifts himself up from the chair. Probably was a little bit difficult for him. He lifts himself up from the chair and he makes his way to Ehud to hear this secret message that comes from God. Are you with me? So Ehud gets close to Eglon, verse 21. And Ehud reached with his left hand and took the sword from his right thigh and thrusts it into his belly. All right? Are you with me? And you thought the Bible didn't have action. Doesn't this look like something you'd watch on Saturday night before you come to church? All right? All right? He thrust it into his belly. And the hilt, the handle of the sword, went in after the blade, and the fat closed around the sword. The fat, let me see how it, how it says, all right? And the fat, I lost my place. And the fat closed over the blade, for he then was not able to pull the sword out of the belly. And the dung came out. All right, little graphic there, all right? But you can handle it, all right? Lunch isn't for an hour or so. Verse 23, then Ehud went out in the porch and closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked him. And when he had gone out, this, is, this even is a humorous part to me, and when he had gone out, the servants, so Ehud escapes, and Eglon has all of these servants. He's the king of Moab. So he has all of these servants that when Ehud leaves, they thought he was getting a secret message from God. So they go out. While they're out, Ehud stabs him with this 12 to 18 inch dagger that goes so far in that the fat envelops it. Ehud escapes, and now the servants come back in. And when they saw that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, surely he's relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. You might sit back and think, what does that mean? It means exactly what you think it means, all right? So, so, so here the servants come in, the doors are closed, and they're like, should, no, we, should we? No, he's probably in the bathroom. He's probably doing, you know, his business there in the bathroom. Let's not disturb him, because if we go in and he's doing his business in the bathroom, guess what's going to happen to us? We're going to be in trouble. So they said, let's just wait outside till he's done his own business there in the bathroom. Verse 25. And they waited till they were embarrassed. Would you like to know how long they stood out there? All right, let's play a game of dice while we're waiting for him, all right? All right, so they waited for him until they sat back and thought, something's not right here. He normally doesn't take this long in the bathroom. They waited till they were embarrassed, but when he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took the key then and opened them, and they found their Lord dead on the floor. Ehud escaped while they delayed. So, so, so it's really interesting. Brad and I were talking through this, and the NLT gives a little bit, whether it's true or not, we couldn't really find it in the Hebrew. The NLT gives a little uh, indication that maybe Ehud, the way he escaped, because you might sit back and think, how in the world did he escape from these servants who were right outside the door of the king's private quarters? And there's maybe a little bit of indication in the text that he slid down the latrine in order to escape. He escaped the only way that he could. Ehud escaped while they delayed, and he passed beyond the idols and escaped to Sariah. When he arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. Then the people of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was their leader. And he said to them, notice verse 26, or 28, I'm sorry, follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him and seized the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites, and they did not allow anyone to pass over. And they killed at that time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able-bodied men. Not a man escaped. Verse 30, so Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land of Israel had rest for 80 years. Now, I read that and think, don't tell me the Bible doesn't contain drama. Don't tell me the Bible doesn't contain intrigue and maybe just a little bit of humor. All right, now, if you weren't in church and you didn't have your serious face on, you'd have chuckled a little bit when you read that story, right? 
if you're in church now and you're like, I don't know how I'm supposed to respond. Or, uh, am, am I allowed to laugh at a bathroom joke in church? I'm not, allowed, I'm not sure how I'm able to do that. All right, you've got to admit that this has some intrigue. And I would encourage you that the other stories in the book of Judges, though not similar, have intrigue as well. So what is it that God is trying to teach us through this story? You might even sit back and say, okay, Brian, I, I enjoyed it. I, I get it. But what in the world can I learn from this story? Before we dive into your outline, let me tell you what the Bible is not saying here, all right? The Bible is not showing us how we should respond to our enemies. That's not what the book of Judges is teaching us. The admonition is not that you leave here today and you get yourself a 12 to 18 inch dagger and you attach it to your right or your left thigh and you take it to work or wherever you're going just in case you might need it. So please don't leave here today and say, man, Pastor Brian gave us the green light. If we have an enemy who's not treating us well, I know exactly how I'm supposed to take care of him. You know as well as I do, that's not the purpose of the book of Judges. And I would say this as you read through the book, and we felt like we needed to address this. As you read through the book of Judges, there is a lot of violence in the book of Judges. Quite frankly, it's one of the problems that atheists or agnostics have with Scripture. As they look at Scripture, they sit back and say, how in the world do you connect a God of love with the events that take place, all of the atrocities, all of the violence, all of the killing in the Old Testament, and you might be here today, and you might be struggling with that as well. Let me say, first of all, I get it. I understand it. And let me also say that, that there's not two different gods in the Bible. There's not the God of wrath in the Old Testament and the God of love in the New Testament. There's one God who has always and has always been a God of love. But we need to understand that, that life in the ancient Near East in Old Testament times was not easy. Life was extremely violent in the ancient Near East. And you and I try to read the events of the Old Testament and we understand them with a 21st century mindset, with a 21st century understanding, not understanding was lo- what life was like in Old Testament times. Many of Israel's enemies were guilty of unbelievable atrocities. Atrocities beyond our imagination. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? Decapitations. The flaying of skin, the skinning of people who are alive. Killing parents in front of their children. These were normal, everyday acts in the ancient Near East. And thankfully, you don't see God's people com- committing any of those things, especially in the book of Judges. You will see God's people defending their territory and only taking back what the enemies of God had taken from them. And so I would say with you that I'm thankful that the world in which we live today is a much more civilized place. But the lesson is not be like Ehud, all right? If you walk away today thinking the lesson is be like Ehud, that's not what God is teaching us here in Judges chapter 3. What are the lessons then? So what can we learn from a story of a fat man who was stabbed and left in the bathroom to die? (laughs) What can we learn from that story? And there are stories to learn. This morning I was in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 having my devotions. And and the Apostle Paul is talking about some of the Old Testament stories and things that happened. And two times in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 he makes this statement. He said, but those stories are given for us as an example. They're an instruction for us as to how we should live and more importantly how we should believe. So what is this story? And even as an overview of the book of Judges, what do these stories teach us? Let me share four things with you today. The first is this. Sin brings God's judgment. Sin brings God's judgment. Now, you might read this and think, oh, my word, boy, God's being unfaithful to his people. Why would God judge his own people over and over and over again? And I would remind you that God's response is not unfair. As a matter of fact, he had previously warned his people that their sin would be punished 
by him. Let me show you a, a couple of verses in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 58 and 59. Before Israel ever went in and conquered the promised land, notice what God told them. God said, if you are not careful to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring on you and on your offspring extraordinary afflictions, afflictions severe and lasting, and sickness grievous and lasting. In verse 64 of that same chapter, he said, And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples from one end of the earth so God had repeatedly warned his people. As a matter of fact, in Numbers chapter 13, he makes this statement. He said, be sure your sin will find you out. What does that mean? You cannot escape. Sin always bears consequences. And we see that not only in the book of Judges, even though you're going to see it repeatedly. Next week we're in, we're in chapter 4, and Brad's going to be speaking on, on Deborah, and the same thing happens there. You're going to see it repeatedly. Sin brings God's judgment. But not only in Judges, throughout the Old Testament, God repeatedly judged and punished the sins of his people. Here's what I want you to catch, though. Sin not only brought God's judgment in the Old Testament, but sin brings God's judgment today. Does that resonate with anybody? I know it's early in the morning. It's actually only 10.02 this morning, all right? Are you awake? If I see anybody sleeping, I'm going to yell really loud and wake you up, all right? Sin not only brought God's judgment in the Old Testament, but sin brings God's judgment today. Let me morph to the New Testament, and here's what Paul says in Romans chapter 6. Verse 23 says this, For the wages of sin is death. You can quote that with me. Paul, Paul said, the consequences of sin is death. The consequences of sin is God's judgment. And quite frankly, church, I know none of us like to hear that, but, but we cannot understand nor appreciate the grace of God. We cannot understand the grace until we understand the righteousness and the holiness of God as well. The consequences of sin is judgment. You would say, and I've had people say to me, and you maybe have had people say to you, but Brian, I don't get it. Isn't God a God of love? A God of love couldn't and wouldn't allow sin to produce judgmental consequences, right? By the way, that's the prevailing thought in our culture today. One of our, one of our sports heroes, Aaron Rodgers, recently said this. He said, I don't know how you can believe in a God who wants to condemn most of the planet to a fiery hell, what type of loving, sensitive, omnipresent, omnipotent being wants to condemn his beautiful creation to a fiery hell at the end of all of this? That's the prevailing thought of the world today. God, that, that's not God. That's not the type of God that I believe in. I want you to catch this, church. The truth is that God doesn't want to send anyone to hell. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, he said, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowless, but is, I love this, he is patient toward you. Man, if you underline anything in your Bibles, underline that. God is patient toward you. Aren't you glad God is patient with you today? That he doesn't respond the first time you blow it, or maybe even the second time you blow it. He is patient toward you. Notice what he says not willing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Here's what I want you to see. God is not just a God of love. He is. He's a God of compassion, a God of love. But he's also a holy, righteous, and just God. You cannot separate the holiness, righteousness, and justness of God from the love of God as if they were distinct characteristics. God is love, but God is holy. God is love, but God is just. God is love, but God is righteous. In his holiness, he judged Israel. 
in his love, and we'll see in just a few minutes, in his love, he sent a redeemer, a judge, a deliverer to deliver them. God in his holiness judge Israel. In his holiness, he judges sin today. But in his love, he sent Jesus to be the judgment for our sins. Romans 6.23, we only quoted the first part. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I love, I love that verse, and I'm, I'm going to mess it up. It's in Romans chapter 3 somewhere, where it's talking about Paul is defining the justice of God and everything, and he makes this statement. He's talking about the fact that Jesus is the answer to all of this, and he talks about the fact that he sent Jesus so that God might be the just and the justifier of those who believe in him. You see, because of Jesus, he can maintain his holiness and his righteousness and judge sin. But at the same time, he sends Jesus as the judgment for all of our sins so that we do not have to experience that judgment. I remember when, when Justin was just a little boy, we were, we were in Mexico, and Justin was just beginning to understand the gospel and, and, and he would pray, and he would pray in that simple childlike form. Vicky will probably, probably remember this. And he would make this prayer. He'd say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross so I didn't have to die on the cross. And I wanted to sit back and say, wait a second, let me correct you. You'd never have to die on the cross. But, but man, he's exactly right. Jesus became the justice. He took the wrath of God for us. But let's not minimize the fact that sin brings God's judgment. You and I can say today that we are not condemned. Romans 8, 1. There's no condemnation to those who, who what? Who attend Hollywood Community Church, right? I wish that was the case. It's not. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Why is that? Because Jesus took our judgment. The book of Judges clarifies for us the holiness of God. Sin brings God's judgment. Let me show you a second thing quickly. I like this one. The second thing is this. God is sovereignly involved in all the affairs of his children. So I don't know if if we read the story, if you caught it. So in, in the beginning of the story, in verse 12, Israel once again sinned. And verse 12, it says this. The Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel. Why? Because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. So because of Israel's sin, God what? God strengthened this pagan king and allowed this pagan king to conquer his people. So God was involved in the judgment at the beginning of the story. But I'm not sure whether you caught the end of the story. So in verse 28, it says this. After Ehud comes in and does his thing right there with Eglon, it says this. Follow after me. Ehud's calling the warriors together. He says, follow after me. For the Lord has given the enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? Are you awake? Did you catch it? What what happened? God was sovereignly involved in their judgment. And God was sovereignly involved in their deliverance. God had a purpose for their judgment And God had a purpose for their deliverance as well. God was at work at both ends, accomplishing his will in their life. That principle is true for your life and for mine. God allows the bad with the good. God sends burdens along with the blessings. Sometimes his works are great, and sometimes his works are grievous. Did you ever feel that way in your life? Did you ever feel about, sit back and think, God, what in the world are you doing to me? God, you said that you love me, and yet I'm experiencing problem after problem after problem, acting or thinking as if God was not at work in your life. And I would encourage you with the truth that no matter what is happening in your life, whether you're going through a time of blessings right now or whether you're going through a time of burdens right now, whether God is greatly working in your life right now or whether God is grievously working 
in your life right now. Where, whether you're experiencing a time of plenty right now or whether you're experiencing a time of shortness right now. Whatever it is that is going on in your life, God is sovereignly at work in each and every situation. You'll see in each of these stories through the book of Judges, it was God who sent the judgment and it was God who sent the deliverer. Here's the key I want you to catch. Somehow, God is able to mix all of that together to accomplish his perfect will in your life and mine. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, you know it. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. You guys are a really sharp crowd. What does the phrase all things mean? Some of the things? The good things? No, all things. God is able to take the judgments along with the victories. He's able to take the burdens along with the blessings. He's able to take all of that, throw it in a pot, and accomplish his perfect will in your life and mine. I've told this story over and over and over again, but a verse that God used one night a long time ago in my life to transform my thinking was Psalm 37, 23. It was a night that Amber was in the hospital. We wasn't sure whether he was going to make it. And I wrestled with God all night long. How dare you open scripture? Couldn't find any verse that spoke to me until I get to Psalm 37, 23. Where the psalmist said, the steps of a good man are established by God. Though he fall, he will not be left alone because God upholds him with his right hand. And God taught me a lesson that day that has been a pillar in my life since that moment. Whatever happens in my life, I can trust God. Because in his sovereignty, God is allowing it to happen. We see that in the life of the Israelites as well. He was sovereignly involved in all of their affairs. He had a plan for the Israelites and I would encourage you today that he's got a plan for your life as well. How do you respond then when the plan isn't going like you want it to go? How do you respond? You trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Just like you trust him when everything's going well. You trust him when the problems come as well. Let me show you a third thing. The third thing is this. Repentance leads to deliverance and rest. You're going to see this throughout the book of Judges. Repentance leads to deliverance and rest. In chapter 3 and verse 15, after Eglon had came and conquered them and they were underneath his bondage for 18 years, verse 15 says this, Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up a deliverer for them. Read chapter 4 and verse 3. I won't take the time to do it. It says almost the exact same thing. Read chapter 6 and verse 7. It says almost the same thing. When God's people cried out to him, God responded. He didn't ignore them. He didn't drown out their cries. It's not like, you know, God's sick and tired of their inconsistency and they're crying out to God and God's up in heaven going, no, 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 I don't want to hear it. That's not the way God responded. He didn't ignore them. He didn't drown out their cries. Rather, he responds to their repentant cry for help. They cried out to God and God sent them a deliverer simply define repentance this way, a change of mind, which results in a change of action. So they realized at that moment, maybe it took them 18 years, maybe they were hard-headed, like we say in Spanish, duro de cabeza, maybe they were hard-headed, and it took them that long, but when they realized it and they cried out to God, God responded to their cries. I love the words of the psalmist in Psalm 34 and verse 17. It says this, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. You've got to underline that verse in your Bible. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Here's what I want you to catch today. It is a repentant heart mixed with faith that moves God to respond. It's a repentant heart 
mixed with faith that moves God to respond. You might sit back and say, Brian, I believe that, but it doesn't apply to me because I'm not that bad of a person. I mean, there are pagan people in our society that certainly need to repent, but that certainly doesn't apply to me. We're praying for revival to take place here in South Florida. I appreciate it so much, Dr. Bob Barnes, as he ended his message last week. I'm not sure whether you caught it, and he prayed. As he knows, as a leadership of South Florida, we're praying for God to bring revival. And did you catch his prayer? He said, God, would you be kind enough and start revival right here at Hollywood Community Church? And he prayed for that. And that's our prayer as well. Here's what I want you to catch today, church. Revival begins. It doesn't begin with, you know, a program. We can't fabricate revival. Revival doesn't begin because we say, okay, all of us make a commitment. We're going to go out and share the gospel with 10 people this week. That's not the way revival begins. Revival always begins with repentance. It begins with God's people humbling themselves before Him and repenting. It begins with repentance as God's people are broken by their sin. Confess it, repent of it, and turn to Jesus. I say that because I know our community desperately needs repentance. Hollywood's a tough place. I get that. But for us to experience revival out there, guess where we have to experience revival first? In here. And for us to experience revival here, I have to experience revival here. You see, revival and repentance doesn't begin with someone else. It begins with me. It begins with you, where we no longer minimize our sins as if our sins are not near as grievous as the sins of other people. But we, but we realize, God, my lack of faith displeases you. God, the way I speak with my spouse displeases you. The way I put other things first in my life displeases you. And God, I repent of who I am, and I desperately need you in my life. Church, that's where it begins. Could I ask you today, could I ask you this morning to examine yourself? Is there a sin in your life which is hindering God, which is hindering the Holy Spirit from producing revival in your heart? You see, before we can pray for revival in our church, we got to pray for revival in me. You see, repentance brings deliverance. It brings peace. We see that in this story. Here's the fourth truth, and I'm done. The fourth truth is this. The ultimate hero in the book of Judges is not Ehud, it's not Samson, it's not Gideon. The Lord is is the ultimate hero in the book of Judges. We read the story and we're impressed with the bravery of Ehud. And actually, we've read the, the, the end of the chapter in verse 31. There's this guy, Sam, Sam Gar, who took an ox goad, which was just a, a stick with a point on the end of it. And he said that he killed 600 men and delivered the Israelites. And we sit back and we think, oh my word, those are stories of bravery. Those are stories of, of heroism. We need to realize that the hero in this story is not Ehud, it's not Samgar, it's not Samson. The hero of the story is God. Sixteen times in this book you will find the story repeated with a, de- with a different hero each time. In reality, though, there is one hero behind the scenes who is working in the heart and lives of of his people. He is the one who raises up the judges. He is the one who empowers them. He is the one who leads them to victory. It's God 
who delivers his people from hopeless situations, and he does it in surprising ways. I wish we had time this morning, we don't, but I wish we could walk through the Old Testament and remind ourselves how God delivered his people in surprising ways, using unlikely heroes, men and women that you and I would not have selected, yet God in his omniscience and his sovereignty selects them and demonstrates his power through them. And he becomes and is the hero of the story. Here's what I want you to catch today. What God did for the Israelites, he desires to do for you. Catch that today. What God did for the Israelites, he desires to do for you or for you. So, so, so here's the way that, that God kind of worked this in my heart. And I'm done today. Because I sat back, and it's easy for us to read this and think, oh my word, these people are atrocious. Thank God I'm not like them. You know, and have this Pharisaic attitude. And here's what I realized. I realized that apart from Jesus, my story is very similar to the book of Judges. If you eliminate Jesus from my life, and even with Jesus in my life, my story mirrors this. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? Are you involved in oppression of women? No, no, I'm not saying any of that. Don't jump to any wild conclusions here. Here's what I'm saying. I am just as inconsistent as the Israelites are. You would think, I wish I could look at you today and say, man, I trusted Christ, you know, 40 some years ago. And ever since I trusted Christ, there's just been one straight line of spiritual growth. I've never floundered. I've never fallen. I've never done anything. Ever since Jesus came into my life, my life has been incredibly consistent. But that's not the story of my life. And I'd venture to say it's not the story of your life as well. If you're like me, your life is a little inconsistent, right? And you probably go through these repetitive cycles in your life where you're on fire and God's real in your life and then something happens or life happens and you become cold and you kind of, you know, chill just a little bit. And all of a sudden God reminds you once again who he is and you get on fire for him again only to what? Get cold again in your life. That's the way it is with me. And if it was just Brian, I'm sure God would look at me and he would be so disgusted with the inconsistency in my life. But here's the cool thing. I'm not the hero of my story. The hero of my story is Jesus. And when God sees the inconsistency, here's what he sees. He looks at me and he sees the consistency of Jesus through me. And so my prayer is not, God, help me to be the best Brian I can be. My prayer is for me to live as Christ. May the holiness, the righteousness, the consistency of Jesus Christ shine through me because I will never be the hero of my story. But Jesus is the hero of my story. Is he the hero of your story? You see, we have a tendency to play this religious game where all of a sudden it's about being better and fixing this and fixing that. And I'm here to tell you, you will never be good enough. You say, Brian, how do you know? Because I'm not good enough. I struggle in my own life. And I'm so thankful for Jesus, who's the hero of my story, that God looks at me and I'm not condemned today, not because I'm good, perfect, or whatever, but I'm not condemned today because Jesus is everything that I'm not. And we're going to see that over and over again in the book of Judges where God comes through and he is the hero of the story. Would you allow God to be the hero of your story? You see, here's what it looks like. It looks like just a life of faith each and every day where I sit back and say, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to begin the day by surrendering myself to him. I loved what Bianca said just a few moments ago, that when she was on her way to Starbucks or wherever, she sat back and she spent time with God each and every day. Why is that? Because she realized that she couldn't be the employee of Starbucks that she needed to be unless God was on her side. And you can't be the husband, the wife, the employer, the employee, the neighbor, the student that God wants you to be unless Jesus is by your side helping you to be everything that he wants you to be. He's involved in the beginning of your story and he's involved at the end of your story. Would you simply trust
Let's stand today. The praise team's going to come out, and we're going to end the service in praise today. So, so here's what I want you to do this morning in your heart. Would you do this? Would you just examine your heart today? First of all, I would start in the very beginning. Has there been a time where you realized that your sin brings consequences, and you have repented of that sin to God, and you have responded in faith to Jesus and what Jesus did on the cross for you. If there's never been a time like that in your life, I mean, I'd encourage you right now this morning to bow your head and to bow your heart and give your life to Jesus. We have deacons down front, we have deacons in the back, we have deacons in the balcony who would love to have the opportunity to pray with you. If you've never made that decision and made Jesus the hero of your story, would you do it today? Maybe you're a believer here today and say, Brian, been there, done that, thankfully. Man, God saved me. So are there inconsistencies in your life? And, and you're demonstrating a little bit of the ebb and flow that take place in the book of Judges. I'd encourage you, where you are, at an altar, with someone else, you just spend a few moments with God today and say, okay, God, help me to be what I cannot be in and of myself. Help Jesus to be the hero of my story. Help me to trust him, and may the righteousness of Jesus Christ live and shine through me. Father, thank you for the truth of this passage of Scripture. Help us to understand it and apply it to our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.